Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. Hi. It's <laughs> fun to see all these Hi, names Jamie. Up here. Hi. Hello. Hi. I don't know Hello. who's speaking, but hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. Wow. Nice to see Let's everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Familiar faces. Hello, Lucy. <laughs> hi. Familiar names. Okay, oh. well, I will kick things off. If you've been to any of uh, these events in the past, you've probably heard some of some of these introductory remarks before. Um, but I I will um, repeat repeat them because um, they are all important for each event. So welcome all. Um, I am Jamie Asaya Fitzgerald, director of. Poets and Writers California Office and Readings and Workshops West Mini Grant Program. I'm based in Los Angeles and I'm here with Dan Tran Kongwen, who will be providing technical support and helping to moderate this town hall. Mm -hmm. Dan Tran is based in San Francisco. Because colonialism is an ongoing process, we wish to acknowledge that we operate on the traditional lands of the Tongva, Tataviam, Chumash, and Ohlone peoples who made their homes in and around the area we now call Los Angeles and San Francisco. Since the beginning of the pandemic and sheltering in, PNW has been presenting these virtual community building events including check-ins for writers and literary presenters and town halls like this one. PNW is the largest nonprofit organization serving creative writers, and these events help us fulfill our mission. And that mission is to foster the professional development of poets and writers, to promote communication throughout the literary community, and to help create an environment in which literature can be appreciated by the widest possible public. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to moderate today's event, Poetry in Times of Crisis, featuring Lucille Lang Day and Ruth Nolan, co-editors of Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California, and Molly Fisk, editor of Fire and Water, a climate crisis anthology. Both anthologies address issues of climate change, especially wildfire and water scarcity in California, and the ways in which poetry and really any writing can help create the narratives we need to connect, transform, and inspire action. I hope the material information shared today will help empower all of us as we approach another beautiful yet dangerous summer in California. I'd like to thank the California Arts Council for its support of these community building events. And then just a few um, etiquette tips for Zoom. Please stay muted during the presentation. Please feel free to use the chat to express appreciation, ask questions, and share resources. We will have a discussion and question and answer period after our speakers. So um, if you have questions that you want to ask, you can put them in the chat and we'll backtrack and try to get to as many as we can. During this event, we ask that all attendees practice nonviolence in the chat and with each other and with our presenters. Any disruptors will be removed from the event. Please note this event is being recorded and a video will be posted to our Poets and Writers YouTube channel. You are welcome to keep your camera on or off. And one last tip. If you would like um, to see the speaker highlighted, I suggest that you go up to your view control in the upper right of the Zoom screen and choose speaker view. And you can toggle back and forth between speaker view and gallery view. Um, and because we're not gonna spotlight 
the speakers that that can get a bit clunky. Um, but if you choose the speaker view, you'll get you'll get the larger picture. So now please welcome our first guest, Lucille Lang Day, and she will be followed by her co editor Ruth Nolan and then Molly Fisk. We are pasting the agenda in the chat and the bios of our presenters in the chat. So you can look there if you'd like to learn a little bit more in detail about their accomplishments. <laughs> okay, welcome, Lucille. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so first I'd like to say thank you to Jamie Fitzgerald and Poets and Writers for hosting this event. And also thank you to everyone attending. Um, this is Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California, the anthology that I'll be talking about. Um, I got the idea for this anthology 10 years ago, back in 2011, um, but I wasn't able to make it happen alone. In 2015, I asked Ruth Nolan to be my co-editor, and it was our partnership that made this book possible. Two other eco-poetry anthologies gave me the idea for Fire and Rain. After reading these other anthologies, I thought that California was such a large, ecologically diverse state with so many amazing bioregions that it deserved its own anthology. So back then, in 2011, I started gathering poems for the book that became Fire and Rain. Having trained as a biologist, I knew about global warming, as well as many of the other significant ecological problems California was facing. But I wanted the book to show not just the problems, but also the beauty of California landscapes. Um, during the years that Ruth and I worked on the anthology, the problems, especially climate change, became progressively more urgent and my awareness of the importance of this anthology deepened. The problems have continued to grow since the anthology came out in 2018. Fire and Rain is an anthology about California ecosystems. The book is organized into eight sections by bioregion. For example, there are sections on the coast and ocean, the redwood forests, and the desert. Ruth and I called the anthology Fire and Rain because fire and rain are so important in shaping all California ecosystems. As it turns out, fire has a good and normal role to play in shaping California ecosystems. There were wildfires here started primarily by lightning and volcanoes long before there were people. The cones of some trees only open to release their seeds when there's a fire. And many conifers, including redwoods, have evolved to endure fires. So while we worked on the anthology, I found it healing and reassuring to read poems that acknowledge that fire is normal here, such as this one by Rebecca Faust. Seeds of the giant sequoia come cone born encased in diamond hard coats. Something secreted encrypts them against climate and time, lets them wait out the cold ground generations of winters. For that lightning crack, thunder, bolt, trunk split of fire to fissure them to life. Dull glitter of years layering down, but when the firestorm comes, the ground melts and boils like stew, swells each seed from germ to Cohen, seeks meaning from rain, memory from pain, how it feels to feel anything. And I also found it comforting and inspiring to read poems about the renewal of life that occurs spontaneously after fires. Um, as an example, I'll read one by Mendocino poet Maureen Epstein. <clears throat> this is called Redwood Grove After Fire. Crunch of black fragments underfoot, 
faint whiff of char, earth beside the trail fresh broken, where a burned tree fell as they sometimes do years later. Cave walls of the ju hollow giants gleam with fresh scorch. Ferns have returned to the flat, though sparser now, more logs among them fallen. We celebrate survival. Redwood sorrel has spread its green sab over ashy ground, warty and wrinkled. The old ones stand in their accustomed silence. Although fire is normal in California, things have gotten out of hand. And in 2020, California had its worst fire season ever. What's changed from the past um, is the impact of human activity. First, as a result of climate change driven by burning fossil fuels, California is registering its highest temperatures ever, combined with droughts that last for years. Not surprisingly, with everything very hot and dry, fires start easily and are hard to contain. This situation is exacerbated by population growth that has resulted in the building of homes in regions that are naturally prone to wildfires. On top of that, we have reckless power companies such as PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric Company, which have consistently put profits over safety. PG&E still has many transmission towers that are more than 100 years old and power lines that are not properly insulated and start fires when they are blown down. Fixing these would be minimal. In truth, I think all power lines in wild areas should be underground. Working on the anthology though, I wasn't thinking about these problems at every moment. There were times when the anthology actually enabled me to get away from the problems, just like a good walk in nature does. Fire and Rain, contains many celebratory poems about California ecosystems, poems that show the many species and landscapes that are still here for us to enjoy and preserve. Um, I'll read a short one of my own now. It's called Fire Muir Woods at Night. Rust colored ladybugs clustered like grapes mate on horse tails that wave by a creek where silvery salmon spawn and leap when the sandbar breaks at the gate to the sea. The ladybugs have come hundreds of miles from valley to coast for this singles bash. The females are choosy. They twiddle the males, seeking appendages padded with fat. And all around, high in redwood burls, on elk, clover leaves and in the rich soil. The meaning of life is to stroke and prod under a humpbacked moon dissolving in fog. Um, I'll conclude by sharing one more eco-poetry anthology here, Poems for the Planet. Uh, this anthology was edited by Elizabeth J. Coleman, who is here with us today. Um, this anthology came out in 2019 between Fire and Rain and California Fire and Water. Um, and at the back of this anthology, there's a guide to activism by the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, the guide gives explicit instructions on how to do such things as reach out to elected officials or get media attention for environmental issues. So I highly recommend this anthology, both for the poetry and for the guide to activism. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucille. And next we have Lucille's co-editor, Ruth Nolan. Greetings, everybody. Um, I hail from Southern California's Mojave and Western Sonoran, I'm sorry, Sonoran Western Colorado deserts. This would be land um, indigenous to Cahuilla, Chamwebi, Serrano, Kachan, and Shoshone tribes, as well as others, and Mojave. So I would like to lend my respect to these people. 
The first poem I'd like to read from the Fire and Rain Eco Poetry Anthology is by Stephen Meadows, and this is called Drought. Hot breath on lupin, on sizzling sierra, parched grass, the seed pods, tick soft in slow wind. On the skittle this summer, madrones are bright yellow, ponderosa, brown needles, low water sucks the stone. It's very timely to have the anthology Fire and Rain Eco Poetry of California, as well as to acknowledge and greatly be dazzled by the Climate Crisis Anthology edited by Molly Fisk. Um, just such an honor to work alongside Molly on some of the readings that Lucy and Molly and I have curated this past pandemic year. Wildfires have been present in my life in California for decades. As a young woman starting at the age of 19, I stumbled into the profession of wildland firefighting, starting on a crew called the Mojave Greens, and then evolved into working for the Bureau of Land Management on the California Desert District on helicopter hotshot and engine fire crews. This work led me close into wildfire experiences and events throughout the state for many years. So unlike many Californians, um, you know, wildfire has become an increasing presence and impactful experience and event with many losses and tragedies and changes. But I've always had fire on my mind because I have all this deep experience working on wildfires. So it's been quite interesting to see it come to a forefront, both in experience and in the articulation of these experiences and the impacts by poets and writers. So Along these lines, when I was one of the only women out there back in the 1980s, and I think this is still true that fire crews are very much more male dominated, women are a much lesser presence. And I felt quite lonely and isolated working as a woman among all these men, and also in the very isolated and disconnected geographies that most people weren't seeing. Um, I remember in Live Aid, those big concerts back in the 1980s, um, all of my friends were home watching Live Aid and I missed it because I was working on a fire. So I had a very interesting, you know, close up. So this poem reflects that. And this is from the Fire and Rain anthology, Mopping Up. It's the most unraveled and well-paying job I've had fighting fires in far flung, lonely wilderness areas in the San Bernardino forest, the Panamint Mountains near Death Valley, the Southern Sierra, Yosemite, the Trinity Alps, the San Gabriel's looming above LA like broken teeth. Most of the line, most of the time, I was the only woman on the crew cutting fire lines, sucking down smoke. And after a fire had laid down across ravaged meadows and once forested slopes, our job was far from done. We hiked in baked potato hot, ankle deep ash that blew eerily in the wind, odd snakeskins shedding in the breeze. We'd finish off the dying wildfires by stirring and cooling the molten detritus with shovels. We sprayed dribbles of water from the fat bags that sloshed like heavy vertigo on our backs. We called them piss pumps. We struggled to keep pace in the slow down underbelly of burned up things in cherished if little known golden state geographies with lonely names. Rattlesnake Mountain, Horse Thief Spring, last chance range, Toro Peak, and above us the whispered remains of once familiar things, lurking black and tall and jagged, stripped of the dignity of their one-time names. Jeffrey Pine, Ponderosa, Western Sequoia, California Black Oak, and at our feet the complete bequeathing of the latter fuels, Manzanita, Western Juniper, Coyote Brush, Poison Oak, and we could never be sure if a fire was completely out. So we'd have to keep stirring ash for days and days, sifting through what had been scorched, watching each unearthed ember spark hot and red, then wish into its desperate last breath long after the flames were gone. And this is what I remember most vividly from my firefighting days. The mopping up, making sure the fire was put to bed, soothing the feverish brow or forsaken landscapes to cool them down. That and how often the guys on the crew, including my future daughter's father, 
constantly asked me why I was out there, why I'd left behind my apron to flirt with flames instead of with them. Last summer, like most people, I was stuck indoors in a smoky, super, super heated California. Pandemic isolated, lonely, scared, and breathing a lot of smoke. Insufferably hot in the desert. We had multiple 120 plus degree days in the Coachella Valley and several power outages, which was pretty frightening. California has always been a state of great beauty and great loss. The very landscape among us, the ground we stand on is constantly shifting, earthquakes, floods, fires, beauty and great loss. And I really feel that these anthologies reflect that quite well. Just as we discover our beautiful microcosms with our voices of poetry and our relationships to our places that we love, almost simultaneously, many of these are being lost to urbanization and increasingly to environmental destructive forces that are growing seemingly more frightening and challenging. So last summer, I was in a cabin in Joshua Tree. It's a cliche today, but I really have been in a cabin in the Mojave Desert for most of my life, um, long before it became a cool thing to do. It used to be, you were a freak if you lived in the desert. Now you're uber cool, so I've arrived. And I was in a cabin, breathing smoke, very hot day. And I had a Zoom meeting with Lucy and Molly because I had this vision and idea to, where we're all feeling so alone and cut off, how about if we come together? And actually Lucy was the one that asked and decided to invite Molly, but I think we need to generate some readings that can include poets and writers and just everybody who wants to feel connected through all of our diverse ecologies, which are all getting beaten up and pounded by these fires, the smoke, the drought, the pandemic, and so forth. And through these great readings we had last fall, um, we did two readings, one sponsored by the San Jose Poetry Center and the other by Inlandia Institute. We gathered poets from North and South and across the state to share poetry, the echo poems from these two anthologies, to bring poets together, to mourn our losses, to try to grapple with not only loss, but the inevitable transformations of our golden state, and just to rebuild and understand our relationships to these rapidly changing places. So like threads in a needle, the power of poetry and the events that we held through reading from the anthologies helped to mend and weave all these pieces of fabric. And this is something that can be powerfully done not only during times of great loss, but it was even emerging before we had this past summer and these devastating wildfire events that um, both anthologies are just bringing together this litany of songs and voices that de tap deeply into deep and magical, sad and renewing, resilient and adaptive and continuous relationships to all of the echo places that we most of us call home. So I'd like to thank once again, um, Jamie for hosting this and having me speak alongside of the fabulous Lucy and Molly and all of the hard work they do as California poets. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruth, both, both Lucy and, and Ruth for, for your work on the anthology and uh, for your incredible comments um, today. Next up, we have Molly Fisk. I am so happy to be here and I'm speaking to you from an acre of unceded Nisenan land at 2,500 feet in the Sierra foothills which is where I live in a town called Nevada City. I've learned, I'm from the Bay Area, so I used to call it Nevada, and my parents are from New England, so I used to say Nevada, and it's taken me a long time to learn to say Nevada, but I practiced, and sometimes operators would help me because they thought I had said Nevato, which is a town in the Bay Area. We were, our town was named Nevada before the state was developed. So once the state took the name, then we had to figure out what to do. So this town is 1500 people, but it's still called a city. Um, 
I wanted to talk a little bit about how this book, I too will show you the cover. It's called California Fire and Water, which was the working title and we never did figure out a better title for it. So it's still called California Fire and Water. Sometimes being literal, especially with a, an issue that lots of people don't really want to think about or believe is happening. Sometimes just being very direct and literal is more useful, more direct than having a beautiful title. And originally it was called a climate change anthology, but during the year of making it, the climate started to become such a crisis that we decided to change the, the title. And I have this terrible habit of saying we, when I mean I, because I really want everybody to be together. And um, it's not a royal we sort of a thing. It's just that I feel like I had so much help. I had so many people helping me by writing the poems and submitting them. And I had four wonderful editors who were helping to screen things. Um, the story of this book is that I um, was the poet laureate of Nevada County. And about a month before my tenure ended, the Academy of American Poets put out a call saying they had a new grant for poets laureate. Um, and the grant was gonna, you, you had to apply while I was still poet laureate, but it didn't come into effect until after I was done. And also they had written all these great things you, you needed to be the poet laureate of um, a state or a nation, a, a sovereign nation, a tribal nation, uh, a city, a town, and they left out county. And I, as you may have understood from my earlier sentence, I don't like to be left out. I want to be included. So I wrote to them and said, ahem, are we chopped liver? And thinking that they would change the language for next year and therefore I didn't have to apply because I was not included. And they immediately changed the language and therefore I was on the hook to, to having been sort of a nudge, I had to apply for the thing. And one of the things they were asking Poets Laureate to do was look at their communities and figure out what was really important. This is my cat Mimi, he's yelling. What was important to the community and how could you include as much of the youthful population as possible in, in looking at it, design a project that would have those two things in mind. And I had worked for 12 years for California Poets in Schools and I was very um, cognizant of breathing smoke from the campfire uh, which happened about 50 miles as the crow flies from my house. And the, the entire time I was going through the process of breathing that smoke, I was thinking about the kids and hearing some, you know, articles about how they were being taught in people's living rooms because their school had burned down and just how terrifying the fire was. Um, so I put together in my head the idea that I could send poets in the schools if I had some money, which I never have of my own. I could send poets in the schools into classrooms all over California and help the kids write about what had happened to them or what they were afraid was about to happen to them. And my background is that I came to poetry out of a crisis that isn't as much of a public crisis. It certainly wasn't then. Um, I started writing poetry because of child abuse and I wrote mostly about child abuse and I taught for many years lots of classes for people who had gone through traumatic experience in the child abuse and um, war veteran range as well as um, I've, for 20 years I've been teaching cancer patients up here in Nevada County. So my entire orientation has always been about how can poetry help people heal from things? And how can we express these little, these very personal detailed situations that actually are part of a huge problem? How can we talk about those? How can we say this? 
So when the fires began to be really much more dramatic, I mean, I watched the Oakland fire. Um, I watched a fire up in Inverness when I lived down in Stinson Beach. I had some experience looking at things that turn out to be part of climate crisis. But back then, you know, in, in the 90s or the early 2000s, we weren't thinking quite so clearly about this as a phenomenon. Um, anyway. That brought me to do the anthology. I thought, well, let's send poets into schools and then let's make a book. But if it's a book just of, of kid poems, it won't have the same kind of draw. So let's get adults involved. And then I was planning last April to do 20 readings from this anthology. Um, and that went by the board. So it's been wonderful to have Lucille and Ruth to, with me to do some readings from this book. I was really stopped in my tracks because of COVID. And this joint venture of ours has opened up just a beautiful way of um, presenting the work and letting people hear the work and promoting other people to write new poems because they're part of, you know, they, they've been following us and listening to this kind of interaction. Um, Many, many, many people have said to me, I thought this was going to be a hard book to read and I didn't want to. And a lot of us don't like facing the hard stuff. And uh, what I keep hearing over and over again is how much solace people are finding. And Lucy was saying this in her talk about putting her anthology together, the fact that there are good things that are happening. Some of the poems in this book are valiant and cheerful, and the kids even are talking about things that made them really um, activated them, made them want to be activists, made them want to know more about the biology and the science. A lot of my friends from around the country who don't know what it's like in California during fire season, now they know because of the poems, whereas a news cycle didn't do it for them. And seeing the dramatic photographs is so one-sided. You don't see the four years later problems. You don't see the toxic town that you can't move back to because all the water's been ruined. Um, there are things that you find out in poetry that you don't get anywhere else. Poetry is so much the language of emotion and it's so rooted in in a specific detail, in an image, in, in the smaller bits and pieces of how humans actually live um, in the five senses. So the, there's a way that poetry is the perfect vehicle to help people understand this and to help people, you know, uh, my whole philosophy is about you get things out of your body and onto the page and then you can maneuver. You can heal things by looking at them carefully but it's hard to look at things carefully. So as a writer, throw it into third person or talk about once, you know, I've asked my students to talk about the things they've been involved with and say what didn't happen instead of what did happen. And that's a lovely back door into writing about hard material. Um, I'm gonna encourage all of you to start writing poems about climate crisis, you know, tomorrow. It's National Poetry Month, you should write poems anyway. And I know from looking at your names and faces that a lot of you are poets. Um, I wanna read a poem by Marcus Wright, who last year was a sixth grader in Sonoma County called My Old House. Come through the dark lane of cold air, like a ghost flowing through your bones. Look around at the huge tree looking down on you. Listen carefully for the sound of sobbing. Walk down the block until you see a park. Run up to the park to see if it's broken. Smell the rain falling in the midnight sky. Touch the rust on the monkey bars. You can make out a human figure of a boy. The boy is sitting on what used to be a crimson swing, looking at a house 10 feet away from the park. Hear the sobbing again 
but it sounds close. You can see the boy crying by the shining tears falling down. And that boy misses his old house. And that boy is me. I kept today, I always do things at the last minute. It's one of my superpowers. And I was reading poems from the book today to figure out what tastes of things to give you. And I, I got very distracted and almost was late to, you know, putting on my blue dress and getting on the Zoom meeting because I was still reading the book, which was kind of a nice thing to do. This is called Smoldering by Michael Rydell, who's a poet in the Ukiah area. Even two years on, any poem about the fire still smells of smoke. Some words glow with embers that haven't yet died. Memory has its own desires. Turns out everything burns, valleys and houses, cars, clothes. Kate had just tied my tie when the text came. No school. I went anyway and checked in with the principal when he got the call, the word, the name of the student I knew well, the girl we'd later lose in the hospital. Poems are like magic baskets. You can shove into them more than you'd ever think they could hold. Her name, Cressa, the wall of smoke I saw over Redwood Valley, the friend who said she saw asphalt flow like black lava, and so much more. The poem still smolders. It breathes the oxygen we use to blow on those last coals, remembering again and again. I think that we have as poets, I mean, we aren't like other people. We see things differently. We see more things. We are, uh, I hate the word gifted, but we have been given um, a capacity and have developed it or were born with it or uh, in some way we have cherished it in ourselves that is incredibly important to the world and especially so in times of crisis. I don't, um, I don't really know what else to tell you except to say giving that away, giving that to people with your own work and with, you know, showing people the work of other people, spreading the word is incredibly important. And right now is a time that's incredibly important to do that. In terms of resources, there's a wonderful anthology called All We Can Save, which is a, lots of essays, but also lots of poems about, by women uh, who are at the forefront of the climate change movement and about what we can do. They, they don't just describe what's gone wrong. There's a lot of momentum about what can we do? How can we be brave enough to do these things? Um, it's been very interesting for me to be reading it over the last couple of months, and I recommend it to you. All We Can Save by Dr. Ayana Johnson and Dr. Catherine Wilkinson. Random House has it. Then the other thing I'd recommend everybody do is look at 350.org, 350.org, a website that says, we're an international movement of ordinary people working to end the age of fossil fuels and build a world of community-led renewable energy for all. And I've had my eye on that for, I don't know what, eight or nine years. Um, I also, if you need, I, I don't know how things are going in the cities, but in the countryside where I live, there's lots of work everybody is taking down underbrush and trying to make their houses more safe in case there's a fire. And I'm, I know my town is going to burn at some point. It's just the perfect um, conditions for it. But what I would say in terms of people finding out how they can help themselves and others around these issues is go to your local volunteer fire station and talk to the fire people. 
talk to the staff and talk to the firefighters and see what they think and who they are and get connected in some way to that part of your community. Um, around here, we, whenever there's a fire, everyone starts baking cookies and taking it to the firefighters and the staff is like, stop, go away, no, it's COVID, we can't take food, you know. Um, but we do a lot of work when, when the campfire was happening our fairgrounds was opened up to all the domestic animals and many others in the state were opened up because people had no place to put their sheep and their lambs and their goats and their horses and their chickens. Um, and one of my friends worked for three months taking care of burned domestic animals and trying to connect them with their owners. I mean, there are just so many things that, that you wouldn't necessarily think of that you can be involved with aside from writing the important poems. Um, I follow two Native American women on social media who have helped me a lot in terms of thinking about climate crisis. One is Jackie Keeler, who I know in person, Jacqueline Keeler, and the other, is, and she's a journalist with a new book out that's about the, um, she's written, she's worked on an anthology that edited an anthology that was up about bear's ears. And then the other person is Rowan White, who's a local person here, Rowan White on Instagram is the way to get a hold of her. And she's a seed saver. And she's been doing that for decades. So she's, she's a farmer and a seed saver. And you just find out all kinds of useful and heartening information by keeping track of the two of them. And then of course, Greta Thunberg and various famous people that are helpful to give you um, both straight talk and some hope. Thank you, Jamie. Poets and Writers has been supporting my work since 1991. Some of you may not have been born then, but it's true. And um, I so greatly appreciate that organization, I cannot tell you. So I'm really delighted to have been here on this town hall. And we are ready with bated breath to answer your questions. So I hope you figure out some questions to ask the three of us and Jamie. Um, and thank you so much for coming or for staying home and watching. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> we need the applause. <sighs> <laughs> I appreciate so, it. So yeah. Um, I think we have a few more resources um, that we're gonna put in the chat, some of which I came across um, in doing a little research and some of which I learned about um, through talking with um, a friend who is a environmental activist, activist um, and also formerly a book festival coordinator, Roz Helfand. Um, and I think we're going to be putting those in the chat um, very, very quickly here. Um, but I wanted to, um, let's see, I wanted to just say a couple of things from my conversation with Roz. Um, I, had, I, I had asked her, you know, what can writers what can writers do? I mean, sometimes we, we ask, does poetry really change anything, right? Or can poetry change the world? Um, and as somebody who, you know, is an activist, um, she said, absolutely, it's narrative is where things begin. Um, and so she said, it's, you know, it's no small thing uh, to write. And we need those voices and we need those narratives. Um, it's true that action, um, you know, is is ultimately what's going to change things. But we need, she said, we need people to change the narrative because the overwhelming narrative otherwise will be controlled by big corporations and other entities, and so poets and writers fight the fight, <laughs> write the poems, write the stories. Um, so I thought that was, you know, a really nice thought and I just wanted to share 
that with everyone here. Um, and she also shared a couple of resources that we'll put in the chat. Um, in particular, an organization called California Chaparral Institute. Um, she said that they are doing really good things to address um, fire and climate change in, in California and taking into consideration the great diversity of ecologies that we have throughout the state. Um, so I just wanted to point you to that. Um, I also uh, will also include resources from our last town hall, uh, which was in solidarity with Black and Asian American communities against violence. Um, they, these are some lists that have been put together by our magazine editors, uh, the editors of Poets and Writers magazine, and they include a lot of really great information um, on those su subjects if you're interested um, in getting more educated or taking action or donating. Um, and so with that, I'd like to open it up to questions for our presenters um, or comments or announcements from the um, group. Jamie, hi. Um, I live in, I'm in Minneapolis right now at my daughter's house and there's a plane. You can probably hear that, so my apologies. But, um, I really wanted to add um, that the past several years I've been creating an ongoing humanities ecologic project which stems from my own firefighting experience as well as my academic research and my work as a writer and educator. And the topic I posted in the chat is called Fire on the Mojave, Stories from the Deserts and Mountains of Inland Southern California. Um, and so I have done a lot of really deep research and field work as well as book research and academic research. And I have given numerous lectures, mostly in Southern California on the topic. And so I'm, I'm hoping to get my website and as a resource posted soon. I'm just an incredibly over busy person, um, but it is an ongoing resource. And if anybody's interested um, in knowing more about what I've learned and what I found is resources and just information, everything from who fights fires to how do I get into firefighting? Um, what are the impacts of desert fires? We don't often think about that and so forth. And um, so please feel free. I posted my email in the chat if anybody's further interested in that. Um, and I've really talked to a lot of different people and organizations you know, as part of this. Um, also, I'm currently working with a wonderful environmental desert group called the Mojave Desert Land Trust. I had posted the link to their website in the chat. Um, I'm working to create a series of desert wildfire events, and we're going to be including indigenous peoples who know about traditional fires, um, fire scientists. I'm going to participate also. And so um, maybe keep an eye out because um, we will have some wonderful events through the Mojave Desert Land Trust, which is also an incredible environmental agency. It just came about about 10 years ago and the need for desert protective events and groups such as MDLT are really important as more and more people are moving to the deserts in massive numbers. And also we're seeing hugely increasing impacts of wildfire. So um, just wanted to throw that out there as another resource. Thank you. Do we have any other announcements or questions um, that the group would like to pose to our presenters or just events that you'd like to share? Either or is fine. <laughs> this is the open forum portion of the, of the uh, town hall. I would like to make a statement. Um, you know, we're, we're worrying about burning fossil fuels and I uh, I noticed two years ago that my gas bill for natural gas was $400 a month. That, that's, you know, that's a lot of money. So then I, I uh, figured out it was in a water heater. I had a new water heater installed and it dropped to $200 a month, still way up in the air. So last, a, week, a month ago, I mean a year ago in March, uh, I turned the gas off and so we're having breakfast about 8.30 in the morning. My wife says, 
it's cold in here. And I said, yeah, I turned off natural gas. For, I gave up natural gas for Lent. Well, that I didn't go over too good, but I, I found out that the worst thing in the world is these electric, I mean, gas uh, heaters for water. So I, for washing, shaving and washing up, I put a pot, a, a, just an electric uh, coffee pot in the bathroom and just put, fill it up with water and push it on. And then in about a minute and a half, you got boiling water, you pour it in. And it costs three cents to heat up the water that way. Three cents. It doesn't work for the shower, but it works for. And so my water bill is now twenty dollars a month. Wow, that's it's amazing. Burning, I'm burning one tenth of the gas I was using last year, and one twentieth of what I. So you should look at your own bills to see what you can do. I mean, you can make it all kinds of pronouncements to everybody else, but you just get your own thing and figure out where the where it's coming. Where, where thank, thank you, Robert. Um, that actually points out one of the. Um, one of the um, big worries is that climate change is a social social justice issue, as you know, water becomes uh, increasingly expensive, yeah. and all of these things are going to impact the poorest people first. Um, so that really, I want to add that, that, really... that you can you can purchase for two three hundred dollars instant water heater, which is electric. Yes, and okay. thank you. And I'd like to um, move on to anyone else who might have a question thank for you. our presenters. Thank you. I believe Nancy Wu has a question. Nancy, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. I want to say thank you to all three of you. That was so amazing. Um, I have so much to think about, so many resources. What I want to share is that I, so I'm a poet. Um, I am going to be doing the Climate Core for reality, uh, climate reality leadership training with Al Gore in um, in a couple of weeks, and uh, I believe registration is closed right now for this session. But if anyone is interested, I can pop the link in the chat for the next session. I think which is later this year. Um, I'm very always have been like many of us interested in the intersection between arts and social justice, and even though I have been aware of climate change for very many, many, many years. It's strange that just recently this pandemic was sort of like a kick in the pants, right? To be like, oh, here's how everything is related. And I personally have been ramping up my investment in um, an, as an activist. And uh, my question, as an activist, I also teach poetry workshops. Um, I'm, you know, lots of other things. But anyway, I have a question. Uh, for anyone on the panel to, um, because in the training, uh, I will be committing to 10 acts of climate activism over the next year, which is great for people like me who need a structure and <laughs> a guideline. Um, so my question is, as I'm beginning to brainstorm and for anyone else who's thinking about brainstorming climate activism action, do you have any suggestions or ideas from your many years of experience about how to link poetry and writing and activism in um, like an action format, like a re you know, like reading workshop, how to, what I'm thinking about is how to link that with the action part, right? Like, of course, there's awareness, but how do we translate that like a writing workshop into political advocacy or some such? So I, that's a very general question. If any, if you have any any thoughts as I'm, as I'm tinkering, I have an answer, a quick answer, one of I'm sure endless answers possible. Um, I teach at Coachella Valley in the East Coachella Valley of Southern California, and um, our students are primarily Latinx, a lot of lower socioeconomic, and they're heavily impacted by the diversion of Colorado River waters, the only inflow to the Salton Sea to San Diego County in a water land, a water transfer deal, meaning money. And the exposed playa is full of radio, not possibly radioactive waste from World War II bombing and also from decades of agricultural runoff. So as the playa dust has been exposed due to this water transfer, the Salton Sea is shrinking up because of that. And people who live in the region near there are primarily people of lower socioeconomic means 
and um, people of color, they're being heavily exposed to dramatic increases of respiratory illnesses. So that region has the highest rate of respiratory illnesses for children in the entire state. Very few people know about this unless you live where I live and even a lot of people in the Coachella, Coachella Valley, the West Valley who don't live near the Salton Sea don't know about this. And so in some of my courses, I've actually had students writing poetry about the Salton Sea and about what it's like to live near the sea to articulate their experiences you know, with such a high level of illness and choking on the dust that's blowing. And then we have shared some of these readings um, with our college campus. And so hope to invite some activism and then also connecting these readings to some grassroots activists who live in the Coachella Valley who have been tirelessly pressuring our city governments to address the issue, addressing Sacramento, as California had promised many years ago to clean, to mitigate the damage. And so this is just one way I can think of is to wherever you can start me as a teacher getting students to generate poetry right from where they live and right from issues that are directly affecting them and having their voices heard about a topic that is pretty much swept under the rug because it's not affecting people with privilege and means. It's affecting disadvantaged communities. So that makes it even all the more important that yes, we need to use this. And um, I found the students get very enthused. They feel very empowered. And um, some even go on to study at universities where they're majoring in environmental justice and law. So just one idea I had from where I live doing that. A weirder and simpler idea would be um, something that we've done up here, which is to take uh, lines from poems that have political weight in some way and give a reference, you know, um, type them up three or four lines, give a reference to where they're from and make copies and stick them under everybody's windshield wiper all the way over town. We do all this weird stuff on National Poetry Month that's more in line with guerrilla poetry. So that's something simple and cheap that you can do and get a bunch of your friends involved with. And um, it's incredibly fun. Sometimes we do it at night. Sometimes we have colored paper. Sometimes we just use white paper. Um, there, that's from the other side of the coin. Yeah, hey, uh, Nancy, oh. I wanted to say, um, there is a huge problem in the Mojave Desert, and this probably doesn't sound right to many people, but um, just so you know that there is a huge push and has been for the last decade plus to site large scale renewable energy projects across Mojave Desert wildlands in areas that are incredibly destructive. This is not the right way to do solar in my humble opinion, or wind because it's not being managed by the communities these are the multinational corporations who are going to be charging us a lot of money and ripping up huge chunks of the Mojave Desert. There's a group called um, Mojave Green, which is a subsidiary of the Basin and Range Watch Group, which I gave the website for. And um, we have held several protests in the last month on the site up near Pahrump, Nevada, of a place that is currently 100,000 year old desert pavement. Desert yucca that's tens of thousands of years old is starting to be ripped up for a solar plant. It's going to be shipped to Los Angeles. So think about the land, you know, extraction and the disturbance and the unfeasibility of doing it this way. And we had a live streamed event out there reading poetry to gather love and support for the desert area there and to rally awareness and to hopefully. Um, just to help educate people about what's going on and that we, a lot of us think that we just want to, it's not a good way to do this. And so that was something that I did recently that participated in that, you know, was at least you feel like you're trying, right? And even if those things still go in like that and disturb the desert, um, you're, you're doing something, you're using your voice, you're sharing poetry and you're gathering people. So um, on-site events can be very powerful as well, especially now with social media. We have all these tools at our fingertips to get our voices out there in activist ways. And Elizabeth, did you have a, have a comment? I do. You know, first of all, I have to say this has been so exciting. All three of you 
um, Lucy, Molly, Ruth, those were such gorgeous presentations and I feel completely the happiest I've felt about the subject in a while. Um, but I just wanted to say, Nancy, um, so here, Poems for the Planet, which is the book I edited in 2019, which has a forward actually from the Dalai Lama. And Lucy um, mentioned the guide to activism. This whole, I come, I'm a public interest lawyer. My background is a public interest lawyer and a poet. And so um, this is kind of, this whole book is sort of a brief for the planet. And I organized it in a way first, oh my God, the planet is so beautiful. The second section is the planet is in crisis. The third section and people, people the social justice crisis. Third section is the animals, the an crisis of the animals. The fourth section is about the children at, who are inheriting this. And the fifth section is poems of hope and inspiration. And I tried to organize it so that people, you go through this sort of, you get depressed in the second part, and then you start cheering up. And then at the end, it's like, okay, here's what you can do. And we organized it by talking to your representative and dealing with the media and dealing with corporations and um, how to organize. And it's really exactly what you're talking about. I mean, that was the whole goal. The whole, this was a very sort of activist project. So I just wanted to say that. And I am so grateful to Lucy for mentioning it today. So, and, um, and, and when I talk about it, like Lucy and Ruth's book, all the royalties go to uh, Union of Concerned Scientists. So it's, it was a public interest project from beginning to end for our planet. Thank you so much. I'm definitely going to order that. And I'm so pr appreciative of all these resources. Thank you so much. I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Roberto Lovato. I'm an author of a book called Unforgetting, a memoir of family migration, gangs, and uh, revolution in the Americas. And um, I'm grateful for uh, Jamie and every all the poets uh, gathered for this event. Um, it's very stimulating to me to think as I try to figure out my next project. And I have a comment and a question. The, the comment is about um, the concept of climate change and environment still seems to be largely focused outside of the urban settings. And I'm wondering um, how we, because I, I, you know, I write about this 2,500 mile journey across war, genocide, mass graves, all the story that's underlying what you're seeing in your news right now with these faceless, storyless children and mothers that you're seeing in the crisis story that's not really new. It's an, it's an old story, at least 40 years old. And so, and it's, a lot of it is urban because, you know, people are moving from the rural areas to the to the uh, cities, and then from the cities to the north. So, um, oh, and I, so my question is: for, I want to thank Molly because uh, you mentioned guerrilla poetry, and one of the things that I come out of in my book is that I was actually a U.S. born uh, person that joined a guerrilla army, the FMLN, because of guerrilla poetry. <laughs> so I was happy to hear that reference. So my question is, right now I'm working on a project called Letters to a Young Poet Warrior. And it's basically Rilke for, uh, Rilke for times of epic crisis. And so uh, I'm thinking of this concept I have of sustainable struggle. And what uh, inspires you all when you think of, uh, when you hear this concept, like uh, what resources, what poets, what poetics do you recommend that I look into to, to kind of deepen my sense of this concept I'm working on. Thank you. I can speak to that just by saying one of the references I have used for years is uh, Carolyn Forche's book Against Forgetting, 20th Century Poetry of Witness. Mm -hmm. And as um, a place to go to hear about all kinds of different angles on wars and strife and damage in the 20th century. It, it's very, um, it's inspiring and it's terrifying and it's interesting. I've used it as a teaching tool for a long time. 
there, I'm sure there are so many other resources like that where you can see the experience of people who've gone through difficulties and have lasted and uh, if not flourished, then at least survived. And the sustainability aspect would be something interesting to look at. So I'd say check out that book from your library. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. And um, really, that sounds like an amazing project, um, something very needed. And I wish you all the best on your work with that. Um, are there any other questions for, for our presenters today? I'm scanning through. I want to of... sneak in a little announcement if I can. Yes, please do. There is a fabulous on Zoom poetry festival happening here, um, the Sierra Poetry Festival, this coming Saturday and Sunday, sierrapoetryfestival.org, with incredible both California and nationally known poets. I'm going to see if I can say this name right. Amy Nizukama Tottle, um, Lee Herrick is going to be there. Uh, my mind is completely blank now because that's what happens to me, but there are probably 15 or 20 amazing poets who are going to be there and some pop-up readings. And we're going to do a pop-up from California Fire and Water next Wednesday evening as part of the Sierra Poetry Festival. About 20 contributors will be reading. So you'll find out information about that at sierrapoetryfestival.org. And that's all. Thank you. That sounds amazing. Um, I love Amy. I can't say her name. Is it um, it, she, she says that it's like the, the Lion King song, Hakuna Matata. That's the rhythm of it. Nezuka Matata. Matata. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Um, I also have an announcement. Um, poets and writers will be holding in its annual workshop leaders retreat. This is a uh, retreat designed for writers who are teaching artists and work with underserved or marginalized communities. Um, and it is gonna be on May 9th. It will be virtual, of course. <laughs> and we will um, be Open, I will be doing an announcement for that fairly soon and accepting registrations. And our special guest for the retreat is Tongo Eisen Martin, who is the San Francisco Poet Laureate and also an amazing poet and somebody who has done a lot of work um, teaching creative writing, um, especially in prisons. And I invite anyone who does this type of work to join us. It's free. And uh, what we do is we spend um, time getting to know each other and sharing best practices and problem solving together and listening to the expertise of our speaker. And then we also spend some time writing together. So it's just a really nice way to sort of honor the teaching artists and um, email me if you're interested. Um, I'd also like to announce that uh, Poets and Writers has a new online tool called Poets and Writers Groups. And it's a really wonderful tool if you are looking to start a writing group or to find a writing group. It has a, a video conferencing uh, part of it that's a lot like Zoom. It's free and it's unlimited. So if you are looking, you know, to meet with with writers and that kind of thing, it's 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 a great resource. It's a great free resource. So please check it out on our website under find your community and you can learn more about it there. And we also have a literary events calendar for anybody who um, is doing events, you can post for free 
on the calendar and it will be national and um, possibly might get mentioned uh, when we promote events from the calendar. Um, so I encourage you to make use of that tool as well. And then um, if you're interested in looking back at any of these town halls in a few weeks time, uh, this one should be posted to our YouTube channel along with all other past town halls. Um, and then last but not least, um, I wanted to um, let you know that our mini grants program for writers who give public readings and teach creative writing workshops um, is still making mini grants for events in California. Although we are almost uh, at the end of our granting cycle for the fiscal year. Um, but if you have an event um, that you're organizing and you would like to apply for your writers, I encourage you to do so as soon as possible um, to snatch up the, the last remaining uh, dollars that, that we can grant out for this fiscal year, which ends June 30th. And, and then we will begin a new fiscal year after that, uh, God willing. <laughs> So um, I also would like to encourage you to give uh, your feedback. I have a little short form. Uh, we'll post the link in the chat. And I really appreciate all positive and constructive critical feedback from the group about the event. It really helps me in planning for future events. Um, I'd like to know what you thought, what you'd like to see in the future and how we can do how we can do better so um, with that i just want to thank everybody who joined us today and i especially want to thank molly fisk lucille langday and ruth nolan for your incredible incredible um activism and work and um generosity so thank you all and thank you dan tran for your help behind the scenes and uh, take care, all of you, and be well. I hope to see you at the next event. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you.